So we start. Um, we just take from the last sentence of the previous week. It's a very interesting sentence. An absolute supernatural darkness falls on man sometimes when he draws near to God. It's surprising because when we think of darkness, it is supposed to be something that is not God. It is the opposite. God is light. So that's perhaps why he has not said unnatural darkness. He said supernatural darkness. Darkness which is darkness for us. We fail to see when we live in a world that is completely, when we are trapped in our littleness, with our little understanding, with our small capacities, with our failures, we feel that, God, please help me to come out of this. We don't say, please let me be no longer like this. We have to no longer be the way we are. We have to break out of our present state. So it is not something that simply helps us to carry on with our daily life with a little guidance or with a little blessing as much as we can receive. But it seems as if nothing is there to help us. From within, usually when we are in difficulty, we think of solutions, circumstances, helpers, guides, people, friends. When we have to change ourselves totally, all these have to be completely wiped away. There is no, it's not a better life, it is a new life, so the old has to go. An hour arrives when fail all nature's means. Nature's means our own willpower or help, strength of character or help from others, all these things which we rely on. You find that I'm deprived of everything. There is nothing. An hour arrives sometimes, but not for everybody. Not for those who are not meant to go through these. There is, each one has his own journey. That is why he says sometimes, forced out from the protecting ignorance, and flung back on his naked primal need. Primal need, the need of his inmost self, naked of all other, you might say, wrappings of mind, life, all these things which we consider our own character, they are all part of the world of half-darkness and ignorance. We have to give up everything if we want to find that one and only solution that can make us break into a new world. So he at length must cast from him his surface soul. That is the surface personality, the external person, mind, life and body, which we rely on, which we call ourselves, this is our self. No, our real self is something else. That is the ordinary human being. Inside the ordinary human being hides the divine being. That divine being waits for the right moment. Otherwise, we are not ready for it. We have to move 
It's like entering sometimes into certain Indian temples. When you go deeper and deeper and deeper, it gets darker and dark, darker and darker. There is no external light. Only when you are ready to go through that will you find that presence waiting at the end. Our being is a temple and we have to give up all other rely on all other reliances. We have to give up everything and be the ungarbed entity within. That is the real person. And that hour had fallen now on Savitri. So today she is completely indrawn, one with her inmost self, her outer self, her outer nature, because she too had taken part in the ordinary human world. She has come down into our earth, our world. She has identified herself with the human existence and all the experiences the human beings go through, she has to go through. How else can she help if she doesn't know what we need? So, a point she had reached where life must be in vain or in her unborn element awake. The unborn element is the eternal. It doesn't begin, therefore it doesn't end. In all of us, we are born. There is the unborn also. The divine one of the names for the gods is Ajata, that which is never born, because it was always there. Before time, before creation, it is there. We are part of that too. But we relate ourselves to this world of limitation, of shape. Everything that is in a form, in a shape, has a beginning, has an end. What starts, ends. We are finite and yet we are infinite. So this is the whole secret to find that infinite in the finite. This is one of the most important aspects of the Yoga of Sri Aurobindo because it is not that we have to give up the external world which is finite. We have to find the eternal and the infinite in the finite. In every, this is Mother's Yoga, in every particle in every cell of the body, the smallest particle, the smallest atom, the infinite is there. Because it is all made by that same force, the same infinity. Therefore, she has to awake to that. We are dormant. She too had for a while identified herself with the immortal. But we are also the children of immortality. We are Amritasya Putraha, children born of the eternal. We are not only children of mortality. All depends, as Mother says repeatedly, what you turn to, what you turn your back to. You turn your back to the darkness and you open to the light. You turn your back to the light and you recognize only darkness. It all depends on what stage you are. And uh, again and again, the image is that of a slope. We are on a slope. You can climb from below upwards, or you can slide from above downwards. It depends on where you turn. So uh, she too had to go through the whole human experience. A point she had reached, where life must be in vain. And if it is in vain, you were just born to die, then why be there at all? That is the principle of so many sages who say, give up this earthly life, give up this worldly life. Why are you here? What are you here for? You are here for a day or for a few years. You live to die. Give up connection with the external world and only live for your soul. But then why have we been given this body? Just to cast it away. We have been given a body, a life, a mind. 
though we identify ourselves so completely with this outer personality that we forget that there is also some other presence inside us. But that is what we have forgotten. It doesn't mean that the other presence is not there. Our eyes are shut to that presence. So we are born and we are unborn. We are human and we are divine at the same time. And yet in what is human is hidden the divine. It is that awakening that has to take place. It is not a rejection. It is not that I have to give up my connection with my body or my mind or my life. It is to discover the presence that is eternal and divine in what is finite. Therefore, her will must cancel her body's destiny. Body's destiny is death. What is born will end. What begins always finishes. But if we make that effort, in fact the word sadhana really means effort. You have to make effort for everything. To achieve anything, you have to make effort. It doesn't come easily. The weight of ignorance, the dead weight of dullness, heaviness, inertia, it's very heavy. But we can break out of it if within there is the flame, the aspiration, the will, what is most important, will. There are so many questions asked to the mother in the classes, questions and answers, and mother, how to do this? Mother, how can we achieve this? Her first sentence often was, you have to will it, il faut le vouloir. You have to will it and you have to will only that, all the time, constantly then it is not just a static will, it becomes a dynamic power. It pushes, it breaks down the opposition because there is a strong opposition. Laziness, ignorance, tamas, dead weight, inertia. The basic par characteristic of matter is inertia. Matter does not wake up easily, but it is the basis of all change. Everything grows in matter. So there has to be something that pushes its way out of this heaviness and dullness. And what pushes is the will. And she has to do the same. Her will must cancel her body's destiny. For only the unborn spirit's timeless power can lift the yoke imposed by birth in time. So these are the two aspects. The yoke, the symbol of slavery, that is put on the neck of the bullock when the bullock is, becomes tied to the cart and the body is the cart and the bullock becomes, this, obeys the driver, will take it forward. The bullock has lost his own right to think and feel. Man is that. He doesn't have a right to choose his path. He doesn't have a right to f decide when he will be, how he will be, where he will live and where he will die. He's a plaything in the world of universal forces. But when we are born, we have to have to accept the conditions that come with ignorance. Only the unborn spirit's timeless power. 
And yet that eternal self, that divinity which is there also within us, that can lift this bondage to the world of imperfection, error, decadence. The ultimate decadence is death. We are born, the curve is that we born, we grow, we decay, we die. This is a cycle. We have to be as if we are trapped in this cycle. Is it not possible to recognize we are projections of the universal energy? The universal energy that was there before creation, out of which creation is born. That energy is what made us, that energy which is us. And then we are no longer slaves of time. Again, that is the fundamental aspect of the supramental yoga. It's a change of consciousness that is inside us. Only the self, he has kept the capital S. There are two selves, the higher conscious being the Divine Presence, which is the Self, and the lower, un, you might say, illumined, limited being that we call ourselves, which is the Self, myself, yourself, the ordinary Self. Only the Self that builds this figure of Self, the outer person is only a figure just like a statue. The statue does not make itself. The sculptor made the statue. There is a creator. The outer form has been made by a greater force. The painter existed long before the painting. Creation is a projection of the Supreme. The outer form is just a projection of one who is above the form. Only that Self can raise the fixed interminable line. Raise is poetical form of erase, wipe off. Otherwise, the line is unbroken. This is called the karmic chain, the cause and the effect what begins has to end, each thing prepares its consequence. Can this chain not be broken? Not by the ego, not by pride, not by ambition, but by allowing that greater Creator to work through us, through surrender, through self-giving, through opening, and this is a very dynamic surrender, not one that lets oneself go to sleep, but to constantly remain open and allow that force to work through us. And then that chain of what is called causality, cause, effect, action, reaction. Even in the world of matter, the first law of Newton, action is followed by reaction. Everything has its own consequence. There is nothing that is really you can do and not expect to have a consequence. You throw a ball in the air, it will fall to the ground. You can't let it, you can't say, I throw the ball in the air, it will stay in the air. If I can make it stay in the air, that means I have learnt how to control the laws of matter. There is another force. Otherwise, I am dependent, as long as I am in my body, on the laws of matter. What is not dependent is that which is not material, the Self, the Supreme Self, can raise the fixed interminable line that joins these changing names, these numberless lives. The journey is long and so one act leads to its consequence. One life is followed by another. One movement has... It's like the ocean of time and 
there is a constant play of rising and falling of waves. It's not that we are allotted only a few years in the world of time and say, do whatever you can in this time. Either you realize something or you go back to the original dust. But if I realize I am an expression of that infinity, then this law of consequence can be altered. These new oblivious personalities, we don't realize that I am today whatever I am because of what I was yesterday. If it's true for now, it's true of all that has gone before me. Today I am some kind of a human being. But I have forgotten that my origin was the mud. I came out of matter. I became a plant. From the stone I became a plant. From the plant I became an animal. And from the animal I became a human being. At each stage I developed more characteristics. But even today, Man is still a stone in many ways. He has the dullness and heaviness and characteristic of cruelty and brutality. He cannot get rid of them. He is also an animal in many ways. His greed, his passion, his violence, all these things are there. Even though he has acquired the mind of a sage, he has not got rid of his vital nature of desires, they are still there. It is not easy to get rid of the past. Each stage prepares the next. One step forward, if we walk on the road, each step forward is possible because, you know, the other leg is pulling you back, isn't it? That's why one step can go forward. When you are swimming, Something you have to fight against the current, otherwise you can't go forward, you have to cut across the water. So this is the whole thing. Something is always pulling us back if we want to go forward. You have to fight against yourself. You have to fight against the state in which you find yourself, the conditions in the world. It is not really such a simple thing that even for us, who are especially fortunate, say, I am living in Mother's Ashram, everything will be done for me. She has given us everything. And if we really look truly and honestly at ourselves, we really have not changed much. We are grateful, we offer our prayers, but not all the time. We fall back again and again, oblivion. Oblivion is forgetting. You remember last time we spoke about memory. That is why it is important never to forget. Oblivion is the opposite. In certain traditions, one of the rivers that take you into the world of inconscience, which is called hell, is the river of oblivion. You have to cross the river of oblivion. If you enter that, you have lost contact with the world of light completely. So, we should never allow ourselves to sink back into oblivion. And yet we do. We don't even remember this present life of ours, which is the result of so many lives that preceded us. These new oblivious personalities and keep still lurking in our conscious acts, the trail of old forgotten thoughts and deeds. That is the whole thing. That is part of the subconscious. I am, maybe all of us are surprised sometimes at ourselves of how low we can fall, how dark we can be, how, you might say, full of all kinds of things that we consciously dislike, they are there, because 
we have grown out of them. Say, I have become a much better person. I have given up all of these lower movements. And then one day, day it comes back. In my sleep, it comes back. In my waking, it comes back. It is a very slow journey. The gravitational pull is very strong. That which takes us down. It is part of our nature. So, only the one who is related to or who is one with his inmost self can break this chain. Otherwise, the chain remains. The trail of old forgotten thoughts and deeds. Disown the legacy of our buried selves. This is the whole thing. Legacy is what you inherit. Our buried selves. The lower nature, the things we say, I have given up, I have outgrown, I am no longer like this. I had, yes, a much worse character than I am now. I have made an effort, I have changed, I have grown. Sure, it's true. But where has all that that I have given up, where has it all gone? Mother compares this nature in one of her talks to a cellar or a basement. It's like when you build a house, you have the basement or the cellar where you throw unwanted things. They are not there in your house. Your house is neat and clean and pretty. But the cellar is dirty. Now subconscious it is that. So this is the old forgotten thoughts and deeds. And they raise their heads from time to time. They demand satisfaction. They ask for their desires to be satisfied. I have to disown this. To disown is, I don't accept this inheritance. I buried our past selves, disown the legacy of our buried selves, and keeps still lurking in our conscious acts the trail of old forgotten thoughts and deeds, disown the legacy of our buried selves, the burdensip the burdensome airship to our vanished forms. Same thing, legacy, airship, we are inheritors, inheritors of the past. Now, if I have inherited something, I have not done anything, I have been given. It has been given to me. I can inherit a fortune. I can inherit maybe something that can lead me to disaster also. This is the thing, it becomes a burden. I have enough trouble living my own life with my own present nature that I know, which I call myself. But all that has come from the past. Mother uses very often the word atavism. Things that come from the past, which we have done nothing to receive. We are simply part of a chain. So, if we look carefully, we find that it is so strong, these forces. There are things that are not necessarily bad or good. We are just moulded by the past. For instance, if I can talk about myself, I have grown up here. I haven't been part of the traditional Hindu family in which I am born. I am born from a family of Shaktas, those who are worshippers of Shakti. And so even now, though I have never done any puja, the mantras of Durga, they do something to my nature. I, I feel a re response in my being, though I have never followed these things in my conscious life and conscious memory, but they are there in my blood. This is 
something that we have just received. Now, what I am now, I can work on to some extent. What I have received from the past, I don't even know what I have received. How far does this kind of things that we get, this is the airship, we are inheritors of the past. Sometimes we receive wonderful things. India is a country that has received infinite knowledge, infinite truth, which we have forgotten, but we can re really recognize the much more easily because somewhere in us the spirit is open than if we were only rational, mental individuals. It is always ready to judge and ready to analyze and explain or examine or deny. There is a response in the being. So it is there, it is something that can be wonderful and be something that can be frightening, but it is a weight, a weight of experience that is transmitted to us. So therefore, these legacy, airship, all these words he uses, burdensome airship to our vanished forms, accepted blindly by the body and soul. So what is us? What is this person that we are? An episode in an unremembered tale. The story is very long. Our present life isn't just an episode, one chapter or even a part of a chapter. It's beginning lost. It's motive and plot concealed, like a story. A very long story, so long that you don't remember really where it starts. It goes back and back and back into the remote past. And why are we, we have not just Savitri, you have Mahabharata. Such a long, complicated story. You have the series of kings who are the son of this king and that one, another king, and then the king before that. So you forget really what these kings represent, why they came on earth, to do what. There must be a reason. The whole pattern is very, very sequential, there is an order, there is a pattern. But why in that order? We don't know. But we have been caught in that movement like a long, vast river. That's why often the image of the flow of knowledge is like a river. Saraswati is a river. She the goddess of knowledge. She flows. Where does she begin? Where does it take us? She begins in the Supreme. We don't know why we have come. We only re relate to our present few years which we call our life. Even that we don't know. And yet, a once living story has prepared and made our present fate child of past energies. The present is the child of the past. The past, the first original starting point is what knew why this long story has to be developed. Like the storyteller, may tell a long, long story, but he has a reason for making a story. He's leading it to a final goal, a purpose. We are in the middle of the story. We don't know where we come from. We don't know where we are going. And this is 
what we are today. This is what we have to come out of. Savitri has come into this world to show us how to come out of this. So she has come to disrupt this. The fixity of the cosmic sequences, sequence, because there is cause, effect, action, reaction, absolutely fixed, fastened with hidden inevitable links, she must disrupt. That is the main verb. She has come to break this pattern, otherwise we are trapped. Dislodge by her soul's force her past. She has come to dislodge the dead weight of the past by the power of her spirit, her soul. Because this past becomes a block on the immortal's road. Make a raised ground and shape a new her fate. This is who she is. Start fresh. There is no past. Go back to the origin, go back to the divine, then we are no longer part of this that takes us constantly towards the final ending, which is dissolution, which is defeat, which is death. So these are the two powers that are meeting today. Savitri, infinite love, infinite power who has come to do this battle for the sake of mankind, and the world of time, controlled by Kala. Kala is one of the names of Yama, of death, that says whatever begins has to end, nothing can go on forever. So this is the clash of that which is temporary, limited, which you call reality, and that which is eternal, infinite, that which is invisible, which is the true reality. And it is this battle which is the issue, which is the theme. Savitri versus death. Savitri fighting not for herself, but for man, for the soul of man. Okay, I have to stop early today.